So we've talked about so far drug absorption, drug distribution, drug metabolism. Finally, let's talk about drug elimination. And when we think about drug elimination, there are a number of ways that drugs can get out of the body, but by far the most common is in the urine via the kidney. So let's look at the nephron, quickly think about what's going on here. The nephron or the functional unit of the kidney, blood flows in through Bowman's capsule. And what happens over time uh, is that the blood leaves Bowman's capsule, but some of it by passive diffusion ends up in the nephron. So some of that, usually by passive diffusion, ends in the lumen of the nephron, goes down toward the collecting duct, up through the, through the loop of Henle and up through the distal tubule, ultimately out to the bladder. Excretion, really, there are three different processes that we're going to focus on here. Uh, the most common way that drugs are excreted out of the body is by passive glomerular filtration. There is also some partial reabsorption and active tubular secretion that can happen in the kidney as well, but the greatest degree of drug elimination out of the body is by glomerular filtration in the kidney. So that process involves uh, um, the filtration or removal of drug. And for a drug to cross from Bowman's capsule into the nephron, it has to be small molecular weight and just fat soluble enough to cross that membrane. Uh, and almost every drug is fat soluble enough to do that. Um, uh, and then it ends up in, in, the, in the urine uh, filtrate. The passive glomerular filtration, typically keep in mind that if the drug is bound to plasma protein, that renders the drug looking like a very large molecular weight drug and won't, won't cross. So if I have, for example, a patient who is toxic on a highly protein-bound drug like phenytoin, the anticonvulsant, or dilantin, uh, what we typically find in those circumstances is that the dilantin won't be excreted in the urine very much because so much of it is bound to protein in the bloodstream, and it just stays in the bloodstream, doesn't cross into uh, via glomerular filtration. This, uh, what we see the rate of excretion will depend on how quickly the drug diffuses from that bound protein. It's also a function of the blood flow and how many functioning nephrons we have, which is also indicative or known as the glomerular filtration rate. The way we estimate our glomerular filtration rate or the amount or the function of the kidney uh, is to estimate a creatinine clearance. And why we use serum creatinine is that creatinine only comes from muscle and only gets out of the body via this passive diffusion. And so there's really, in practice, what you have to do is to consider the, uh, the degree to which uh, uh, the front nephrons are functioning and estimate based on the degree to which this creatinine gets in the bloodstream by muscle mass and out of the body uh, by glomerular filtration. So the first estimate for that kind of glomerular filtration rate uh, in milliliters per minute, basically it's a way to think of this as how much blood, how many milliliters of blood per minute would be totally cleared of creatinine uh, by the kidney. Uh, and the formula that was first done was developed in uh, the VA system uh, typically with men uh, in, you know, between the age of maybe 25 and uh, 75 or so, primarily. And they used the true glomerular filtration and came up with this formula that, uh, that was related to the patient's age and lean body weight and their serum creatinine. And this formula was reasonably good at predicting what their true creatinine clearance was, keeping in mind that the lean body weight and their age is going to be a function of both their, their glomerular function and the, where creatinine comes from, or muscle mass. Uh, and then they adapted this formula to women, even though it wasn't really all that commonly studied originally in women. 
Uh, and they also recommended using a lean body weight for an estimate for uh, muscle mass, which is the source of creatinine. So this formula was somewhat helpful in predicting it, and we end up with mils per minute. And for somebody who has a creatinine clearance of more than 100 mils per minute, that's considered excellent kidney function. And for drugs that are renally eliminated, uh, you don't really have to adjust the dose. For someone who has creatinine clearance less than 60 mils or 50 mils per minute, you're beginning to get into the territory where we have some reduced kidney function. And below 30 mils per minute, many drugs require dosage adjustment uh, uh, to safely use them. If someone has less than a creatinine clearance less than 10 milliliters per minute, we're considering them in failure. Uh, and those folks really don't have, for all intents and purposes, really functioning or very well-functioning kidneys to eliminate toxins and drugs. Well, in the 90s, the next formula that got used that was estimate was called the Jellif estimate. And it did some similar kinds of things, used the same, some of the same variables, but came up with a different formula, and then they corrected it for body surface area uh, and ideal body weight and came up with another estimate. Uh, and the estimates, if you use a calculator or you go to many of the, uh, the there are different calculators online or a phone app you can use uh, that will estimate someone's creatinine clearance based on the serum creatinine and their age, uh, you'll find that these different estimates will come up with sometimes uh, some pretty similar results, uh, estimates, and sometimes some wildly different estimates. And we use these estimates as, uh, as a ballpark guess of where their renal function is, knowing full well that they're not really all that precise. The estimates are limited because they make some assumptions that may not be true. We first of all assume that the serum creatinine is in something called steady state. And we'll talk more about the concept of steady state in the next block. But steady state is the point where the amount going in equals the amount going out. Meaning that the serum creatinine, if you measured it yesterday, today, tomorrow, would be the same level. If somebody has had muscle trauma, or if somebody, which would explain higher creatinine levels, or if somebody's kidney function has all of a sudden gotten very worse, their serum creatinine may lag back a couple of days. Uh, and so uh, if it's not, if, if it's rising or falling, then you need to be quite careful about interpreting that and not making uh, too much uh, of it. Uh, the classic scenario is someone in the intensive care unit, for example, who has poor, has an episode of poor blood pressure, poor perfusion to their kidney ends up with acute kidney injury, uh, and their serum creatinine is going to rise a couple of days, a day or two, after their true kidney function has gotten worse. So if it's rising, you have to kind of think, gee, the kidney function stinks already. If they have muscle trauma we've alluded to, that's a concern. If they're immobile or they're cachectic, or if they have an amputation, all three of those things mean they have less muscle mass. So whatever creatinine they've got in their blood, uh, it's from less muscle. So if their creatinine is quote-unquote mid-range normal, but their muscle mass is low, the only explanation for that is that their kidney function is, uh, by default, is not very good. There are also a couple of drug interactions. I'm not going to really worry that much about them. Usually they're not clinically important. A couple of antibiotics actually affect the serum creatinine level without really affecting uh, the true renal function. And so Sometimes with a couple of antibiotics, we keep an eye on that. Over time, uh, as folks age, their kidney function by default gets worse. So if we look at their serum creatinine, uh, even in the range of quote unquote normal of 1 or 1.5, by the time we get over the age of 50 or 60, kidney function is starting to fall off a bit. Uh, and so you may have this initial temptation in an older patient to look at the patient and say, oh, the same creatinine is quote unquote within the lab's normal, so the kidney function is good. Even if it's within the lab's normal, by the time you get to be 80 or 90 years of age, by default, you're, you have fewer functioning nephrons and your kidney function is really marginal, even though you might look like your same creatinine indicates you're okay. 
There's a couple of other on the horizon different ways to estimate kidney function on the fly. One is uh, 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 cystatin C, a protein marker for kidney functions. Uh, it's not routinely used in, test, in, in assessing kidney function, but maybe in the future, I think folks are trying to look for sort of more accurate ways to estimate kidney function, but keep your eye on that. Um, uh, there's a, a bunch of different calculators that have been around for the last four or five years. I'd encourage you to go to something called, and we'll see this later in the year, globalrph.com, and they have lots of different calculators there. Uh, and even though it's a proprietary site, uh, it's generally found, I think most clinicians find that the data uh, and the calculators there are pretty good uh, and are pretty reflective of uh, uh, lack of bias. There are a lot of drugs in clinical practice that we are concerned with kidney function uh, that require caution when we have someone who has kidney dysfunction. Uh, when we use these drugs, it might be either because the drugs accumulate in kidney function or it might be that the drugs themselves cause or contribute to kidney dysfunction. We'll talk much more about that later in the year. But just recognize that if someone's renal function is off, uh, there are some drugs we need to be careful in using uh, and be careful on if we do use them, how we dose them. So that's glomerular filtration. The other two things that are much less uh, crucial in elimination of drugs uh, are is the concept of passive reabsorption and tubular secretion. Passive reabsorption is that some of the drug that ends in the lumen of the nephron ends up being pumped back out uh, uh, in, back into the bloodstream and the interstitial, interstitial space uh, based on their lipid solubility in particular um, or the pH of the urine. Uh, uh, and so that, that has an impact on this passive reabsorption uh, of drugs. And sometimes we actually sort of influence this concept uh, by changing the pH of the urine uh, such that we could trap a drug uh, that otherwise would be excreted. And a classic example is uh, many years ago and still used in, uh, in some circumstances, uh, we would use uh, for, for an overdose situation, particularly the older tricyclic antidepressants, we would actually alkalinize the urine uh, with sodium bicarbonate, uh, intravenous sodium bicarb, to get a more alkaline urine to adjust the pH in the urine to trap ions in the, the urine and avoid some of this uh, passive reabsorption of the toxin. A third issue is something called tubular secretion. This involves the, uh, the transport of a free drug across the proximal or distal tubule. Uh, the drug secreted right into the urine um, uh, by active uh, mechanisms. And that's an issue for a few different drugs, not too many but a few drugs that exhibit that type of uh, uh, excretion pathway. We also have excretion of drug into the intestines. We've already alluded to uh, this concept of the uh, peak glycoproteins earlier uh, involved in this process. We also have uh, drugs that are excreted uh, in bile directly uh, in the, uh, into the lumen. We have excretion of drugs by the lungs, uh, and classically you'll see here are alcohols or anesthetic gases excreted by the lungs. Uh, classically, you think of ethyl alcohol in the breathalyzer test. Uh, um, so a few drugs are excreted by that route. Some drugs are found in sweat. Uh, you, know, you can sort of know this if you know someone who loves to eat lots of garlic. Uh, and lo and behold, what they are sweating out is the allicin or other containing products in, uh, in garlic. Sometimes drugs are secreted in saliva, and patients will complain, hey, I've got a bitter taste in my mouth, and it's not just right after I took my pill, it's all day and all night long. What's happening is some of the drug or its metabolite is actually secreted into saliva and they're tasting that either the drug or metabolic uh, metabolite of that of that compound all day long. We could also have drugs excreted uh, into breast milk. Uh, we'll talk more about that later uh, in this summer, but uh, the excretion could be 
uh, into breast milk, and breast milk itself is a little more acidic, and so sometimes drugs get trapped by ion trapping uh, because of that difference in pH in breast milk. Uh, so we need to kind of at least be aware of that. So uh, to sort of end this first uh, sort of block in kinetics, when we talked a lot of concepts here, we basically talked about a drug from outside the body getting into systemic circulation, all the places it goes to in tissues, uh, but ultimately to the site of its action where you when then that physiologic property happens and you see a clinical response no matter what it is. Uh, so it's the interface. This graphic sort of has the big picture of where are kinetics versus what are dynamics. In the next block, we'll talk about the concept of time moving along, all of these things of absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination happening over time. How do you dose a product? When do you redose a drug? Uh, what are the factors that go into thinking about all of that?